In the first unit, we talked about anthropology as a science and how anthropology is done. In unit two, we're going to shift gears and get into the heart of the course and start talking about what anthropologists have learned about human culture. One of the most basic features of human culture is subsistence, how people acquire the food and water they need to survive. In some environments, people can easily survive without significant shelter. In some, they can make do with only the simplest tool making materials like wood and bone. Nobody really needs electricity and indoor plumbing to survive. But no one in any environment can ever survive without regular and reliable sources of food and water. So subsistence is one of the few true universals of human culture, and it is so important to survival that we'll see many more complex dimensions of culture can be directly related to how people get their food. Food affects everything. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of subsistence strategy, what your textbook calls adaptive strategy, food gathering and food producing. Your textbook refers to food gathering as foraging, but I'm going to reserve that for a particular kind of food gathering that we'll get to in a moment. Food gatherers rely on natural or wild food sources. Food producers create their own food. Today, the world is overwhelmingly dominated by food producers. Food gathering, however, was the only method of subsistence for the great majority of human history. Until about 10,000 years ago, no culture on earth produced its own food. In the last 10,000 years, food production has virtually replaced food gathering. If we chart the relationships among all the different subsistence strategies discussed in your textbook, we get this tree chart. Let's start on this branch, looking at the food gatherers. Food gatherers are, of course, usually known by the term hunter-gatherers. These groups move around the landscape to follow the wild food sources they're dependent on. But there are two broad strategies for hunting and gathering, and which works best depends on the environment. The first is foraging. Near the equator, the seasons aren't very extreme, and the landscape is fairly homogeneous. Many food sources are scattered about the landscape in the same general location. Think about an equatorial rainforest. Lots of different types of plants and animals pretty close to one another. In this case, the best strategy for a hunter-gatherer band is foraging and residential mobility. Now my definition of foraging is the process of going out each day and gathering enough food from the immediate vicinity to last the day. When the food sources are depleted in the immediate vicinity, the whole band moves together and establishes a living camp somewhere else. This is residential mobility, the moving of one's residence regularly. The other basic food gathering strategy is collecting. Nearer the poles, in Inuit or Siberian territory, say, the landscape is heterogeneous. There are huge individual packets of food, polar bears, whales, etc. But they're widely scattered on the landscape and they're comparatively hard to locate. In this case, the best strategy is collecting and logistical mobility. Collecting is the process of gathering much more food than you can immediately use then storing the extra for future use. Since food is stored, people tend not to move their place of residence as often. Doing so would mean either transporting a lot of food or abandoning it. Instead, the Inuit go in for logistical mobility. A small group of people, only part of the household, leaves their residence for several days or weeks, travels to a distant location where they collect the food, and then they return it to the base camp. In the middle latitudes, such as much of the United States, the landscape is a mixture of those two extremes. During parts of the year, food is available in abundance relatively nearby. Other times, it's widely scattered. So hunter-gatherers in the mid latitudes tend to use a combination of residential and logistical mobility, moving their residential base camp a couple times a year, but sending out logistical parties to gather resources in between residential moves. Thus, we can already see a significant consequence of subsistence on the rest of the culture, 
hunter-gatherer settlement patterns are dependent on the subsistence strategy, and subsistence is dependent, at least in part, on the environment. Today, the great majority of cultures who were, until recently, hunter-gatherers have been integrated into modern nation-states. Most groups have settled into permanent villages and become dependent on produced food, just as we are. The very few people who still actively survive through hunting and gathering are all foragers. Industrialized groups have taken over all the productive environments, leaving only very marginal areas like deserts for the hunter-gatherers. In such environments, where food sources are extremely scarce, storage isn't practical since you never get any extra food to begin with. So, almost all modern hunter-gatherers are foragers. If your subsistence strategy isn't food gathering, it's food producing. Food production is the active creation and management of food sources in order to increase the natural productivity of the landscape. There are two broad kinds of food production, plant cultivation and animal husbandry. Subsistence strategies that focus on plant cultivation are called farming, and those that focus on animal husbandry are called pastoralism. I'll deal with pastoralism first. Pastoral groups are generally nomadic, moving their residences as they move their herds in search of grass and water. They tend to inhabit environments that have adequate grass to feed the herds, but are otherwise unsuitable for agriculture. Either the landscape is too dry, too hot, or too cold to allow for efficient growing of crops. Instead, people keep large herds of livestock, which are able to move around the landscape following water sources, unlike crops to which water must be brought. Animals also provide a whole range of secondary products in addition to their meat, milk and dairy products, leather, fiber, bone, sinew, and so forth. The animals act as storage containers and resource factories, storing the grass food and converting it into useful materials, and doing so with a relatively low investment of time and labor on the part of the pastoralists. However, people cannot survive on just animal food sources. We are biologically omnivores, and we require some vegetable foods to live. Pastoralists must make arrangements to secure those vegetable foods somehow. In places where the landscape is productive enough to allow for some farming, they may take the route of transhumans. This is where only part of the population moves with the herd seasonally, and the others farm. This is the pattern that was practiced in much of the European Alps in the past, and in the Sudan among such groups as the Newer. The alternative to transhumans is pastoral nomadism. This is where the whole community moves with the herds, more or less year-round. In such settings, the pastoralists can't farm their own vegetable foods, so they maintain close trading alliances with sedentary agricultural societies. The pastoralists exchange animal products, meat, cheese, furs, for vegetable foods. The agriculturalists get animal products without devoting their territory to livestock grazing because their territory is probably more valuable as cropland. What this means, though, is that pastoral nomadism usually only becomes practical as a lifestyle after the development of highly productive agriculture, and only when agricultural groups are located relatively nearby. The classic example of this sort of symbiotic relationship is the Near East, where Arabic farmers and pastoral Bedouin have lived side by side for thousands of years. The distinction between Arab and Bedouin is a false dichotomy, however. Bedouin are just Arabs who live in the desert. Individuals and families have traditionally moved fluidly back and forth between settled life and pastoral nomadism as the climate changes, settling down and farming when the land and weather were good, taking their herds to the desert when times got tough. So pastoralism is not always a definitive characteristic of the culture. Sometimes it's only one of a variety of tools for getting food. Let's turn now to farming which today is the most important form of food production by far. The strategy is usually divided into two broad categories, horticulture and agriculture. We'll look at horticulture first. <laughs> 
Horticulture is more or less gardening. Many small tribal societies in Africa or South America get their food this way. Horticultural societies cultivate small plots of land growing a variety of crops with relatively little investment of energy. They often use a slash and burn strategy where a section of the forest is cleared, burned, and the ashy soil is used for crops. The ash returns all the nutrients that have been tied up in the trees and undergrowth to the soil and makes them available to the growing crops. However, as the crops grow and are removed, they take the nutrients with them. Of course, that's the point to ultimately transfer those nutrients to people. But in slash and burn horticulture, there's no way of replenishing the nutrients in the soil other than more burning. So over a period of a few years, the fertility of the plot becomes exhausted. When that happens, the only thing to do is move to a new plot and slash and burn a new garden spot. This is a major investment of energy on the part of the farmers, but it only needs to be done once every few years. Once the old plot has regrown its natural forest cover, trees, bushes, etc., for several years, it can be re-cleared and burned again, but it may take several decades to return to full productivity, depending on what species of plants grow in the immediate vicinity. More costly than clearing the gardens may be the transport costs. As plots near the village become exhausted, people must move their gardens further and further away. Horticulturalists tend not to do much tending or weeding of their gardens while the crops are growing, but they do do some, and the farther away from the village, the more travel is involved. Then at harvest time, the whole harvest has to be carried back to the distant village. During all that travel, you're exposing yourself in the dangerous forest to predators, to accidents, to enemies. So in many parts of the world, maybe once a generation or so, the travel involved in horticulture gets to be more trouble than it's worth. The whole village is moved to be closer to the currently productive plots. So again, we see that subsistence has an immediate and obvious effect on settlement patterns. Now the other kind of plant cultivation is agriculture. In agriculture, the farmers use new technologies designed to do one of two things, either increase the productivity of a plot or replenish the soil's nutrients so moving to a new plot is not necessary. These technologies might include irrigation, fertilization, terracing, mechanization, and so on. Agriculture requires more energy investment than horticulture, but the productivity is so much greater that it often allows individual farmers to produce much more food than they themselves need. Horticultural societies tend to be relatively small, with almost every household involved in producing its own food supply. Agricultural societies are productive enough that some of the population does not need to produce its own food at all. Those people can then spend their time in other pursuits and possibly move away from the agricultural land altogether. This is the origin of cities. And again, subsistence can directly impact the settlement patterns of the society. The primary difference between agriculture and horticulture, then, is how the two strategies make use of the landscape. In horticultural strategies, a single plot is used only some years and other years it lies fallow. So any one spot receives a limited amount of human labor, but that labor is spread across a very large area, which is why horticulture is sometimes called extensive agriculture. On the other hand, in agriculture, a particular spot receives a lot of human labor investment every year, but relatively less land is necessary. Land use here is very intensive, thus the strategy is also known as intensive agriculture. The important thing to notice is that the difference between the two is quantitative, not qualitative. That is, in intensive agriculture, a plot receives more investment, but not a different kind of investment. There can be and are examples of subsistence strategies that lie in between the two extremes, and this is what your textbook refers to as a cultivation continuum. We should be careful not to distract ourselves with labels. It's not important whether a given culture practices horticulture or agriculture. What is important is what effects does that culture's particular subsistence strategy have on the rest of the culture. 
I want to turn now to the rise of agriculture and talk about the best theory about how it happened. After all, for 99.8% of human history, food gathering was the only means of subsistence. Only in the last 10,000 years, out of 5 million, have people grown their own food. And more culture change has taken place in that last 0.2% of human history than in the previous 99.8%. So the rise of agriculture is arguably the single most important event in human history. Any explanation of human culture must address it. But first I want to dispel a prevalent myth. There was never a point in time when people did not know that planting seeds in the ground would result in new plants growing the next season. Making a living as a hunter-gatherer requires an intimate knowledge of the environment and the functions of living things. So any hunter-gatherer who didn't know the relationship between seeds and the next generation of plants would soon starve. So it's not that hunter-gatherers are ignorant of planting and harvesting, they just choose not to do so. In fact, one might say they choose rightly. Hunter-gatherers in general work less, eat better, and are healthier than their farmer neighbors. A Jictoisi man from the African Kalahari put it pretty well. When asked why his family didn't farm, he replied, why should we plant when there are so many mangongo nuts in the world? So why would anyone ever become a farmer? It's all related to sedentism. For a variety of reasons that I won't go into, being a nomadic hunter-gatherer strictly limits human populations even when there's plenty of food available in the natural environment. These biological constraints are lifted, however, when humans become sedentary and stop moving around so much. So once people become sedentary, population densities begin to rise, and this rise in population density sets in motion a sequence of events that ends in agriculture. But what happens here? The best theory about the rise of agriculture was proposed by Kent Flannery in the 1970s. Flannery was trying to explain the rise of agriculture in the Near East following the end of the last ice age, but his theory is applicable to other parts of the world as well. Agriculture developed independently in a half dozen places around the globe, but within a remarkably short period of a few thousand years after the end of the ice age. This suggests that the ultimate cause of the transition had to do with climate change. Flannery's model rests on several explicit principles. You won't need to memorize this massive block of text for the exam, and I won't read it here, but you're welcome to pause the video and read them more closely. Suffice it to say that these five principles are completely uncontroversial. No scholar would dispute any of them individually. What Flannery did was ask, what happens when all five apply to the same culture at the end of the Ice Age in the ancient Near East. He started by asking where in that region would hunter-gatherers want to live? And the answer was the hilly flanks of the Zagros Mountains. At the time, for environmental reasons, this was an extremely productive wild ecosystem. A hunter-gatherer could make his living very easily here, and according to Principle 1, easier is better. But of course, once hunter-gatherers had settled in the hilly flanks, their population started to grow. After several centuries of population growth, some people began to feel crowded. They chose to leave the hilly flanks and move on to the Iranian plateau. This is an example of principle number four, that cultures are willing to change in some ways, say their residents, to preserve themselves in other more important ways, in this case, their feelings of isolation. Next, those new immigrants on the Iranian plateau have to feed themselves. On the hilly flanks, they had eaten foods like wild wheat and barley or wild sheep and goats. All those same foods were still available on the plateau, just in lesser quantities. So these hunter-gatherers, with their intimate knowledge of the natural world, spent more of their time helping those wild foods along. They're not planting or cultivating foods, but maybe they pull up competing weeds a bit more often, or they shoo away wild animals that would eat the barley before they could. This is another example of changing something to keep something more important. The cost of additional labor is less important to the hunter-gatherers 
than the benefit of the increased wild food supply. On the other hand, by changing the ways they tended wild food, those hunter-gatherers were changing the environment for the plants and animals they were exploiting. Principles two and three say that when humans change the environment, certain plants and animals will evolve to depend on those humans. The food sources become domesticated. One change brought on by domestication is that domesticated crops become more productive, giving out more food from each plant. And since principle one says that hunter-gatherers will go for the easiest food source, the Iranian hunter-gatherers began spending more and more time tending and exploiting those domesticated crops. This, of course, accelerated the domestication process. After many more generations of this process, the former hunter-gatherers were now spending so much time and labor tending their new crops that they no longer had time in their schedule to be hunter-gatherers. They'd become full-time farmers. Furthermore, by this time, the population had grown large enough that going back to a solely wild food supply would mean widespread famine. They were just stuck with farming. So what does this teach us about the rise of agriculture? Why did hunter-gatherers ever choose to give up hunting and gathering? Well, they didn't. At each stage of the process, hunter-gatherers were just trying to be the best hunter-gatherers they could be. They settled in the places where hunting and gathering was easiest, they moved to places with the lowest populations, and they focused on the wild foods that were most productive. But in the Near East, at the end of the Ice Age, the combination of those five principles made farming almost inevitable. Similar arguments could be made for other parts of the world where agriculture developed independently of the Near East. It's ultimately not a conscious choice, but the result of long-term processes that individuals seldom are even aware of. This is another important lesson about human culture. Most of the biggest and most important changes are not intentional. They're the unintended consequences of people just trying to get on with their lives. In our next lecture, we'll look at another aspect of culture that people seldom understand, but which is nevertheless vitally important to everyday life, the economy. <laughs>